To succeed in any new rebellion, Robert Emmett knew that he would need support from abroad, and especially, crucially, support from France. Now, France was going through its own changes in this period. It had moved away from the revolutionary France of the 1790s to moving towards becoming an empire under Napoleon. Napoleon became a one, one of three consuls in 1799, and by the time Emmett eventually visited France, Napoleon was the crucial figure in the French system. And it's very interesting that when Napoleon met Emmett, he was very impressed with Emmett. He saw in Emmett everything that he admired in the youthful hero. But Emmett, for his part, was not impressed with Napoleon. He saw how Napoleon and the new French state were treating all of the smaller countries around Europe, that they were turning them into satellite states, that under the guise of liberating them, they were actually plundering them. So actually he became very suspicious about French aims and intentions. And that's why he harked back to that treaty, which Benjamin Franklin had signed with the French in the month of his birth. And he decided that if any new Irish revolution was to be attempted, it would have to be done with French support, but with an agreement in place that the French would only come as allies, assist in the creation of the Irish Republic, but that the Irish would not be substituting one tyranny for another. Especially because he feared that a French tyranny in Ireland would be actually considerably worse than British rule. So there you see a sophistication in Emmett's political thinking and Emmett's political outlook that wasn't really there with many of his contemporaries. Before he set out to France, Emmett visited the Irish prisoners who were being held in Scotland, which included his brother, Thomas Addis Emmett. And he arrived just as his brother and another rebel were to fight a duel. And young Robert Emmett intervened and persuaded the men to shake hands and cancel the duel. And I think that's an example of, again, how persuasive and influential he was. He made his way to France, visited some of the other countries around, and while he was in France, began developing plans for a new Irish rebellion. And he was heavily influenced by what he had learned from the failure of 1798. The fact that in 1798, everyone had known the plan. So all the British had to do was capture some, some rebels, torture them, and secure the information that way, and the plan was, was known. Or they just had to infiltrate with their informers and spies and break the secret that way. And he realised that if any future plan had any chance of succeeding, it would have to rely on absolute secrecy. An elite group would have to plan all of the details and only send the signal at the very last minute. While he was in France, while he was in Paris, he also began experimenting. Even as a kid, he had loved playing around with chemistry sets, with various different experiments, and he was the same in Paris. Because the French had brought back these designs from India of prototype rockets. They had been used against Arthur Wellesley, the future Duke of Wellington in India, in 1799, and his men had turned around and ran away. They were so upset uh, they were so uh, uh, destroyed at being attacked by these weapons firing horizontally into them. And, he be and Emmett began experimenting around with these prototype designs and decided that this could be a crucial part of any rebellion in Ireland. He also had the problem that had afflicted the rebe rebels in 1798, that their chief weapon, the pike, was far too big, especially if you were planning to start the rebellion in Dublin, because you can't really go around a city centre with an eight foot long weapon, with a big point at the top. So he came up with the ingenious idea of putting hinges in the centre. So that way, the men could walk around with the pikes folded over underneath their coats. And then when they would get near the British troops, they could almost ninja style, take out the pikes, fold them out and get ready to attack. So Emmett spent a lot of time in Paris working on things like this. He also began studying military textbooks. There wasn't really, there was no experience in the world of a guerrilla warfare campaign, but Emmett found a book about fighting a campaign in the mountains and adapted that to see how you might fight a similar campaign using buildings instead of mountains. And so he developed the world's first urban guerrilla warfare style campaign. And he brought all of these plans back to Dublin in 1802. 
He arrived back just as his father was uh, uh, suffering from a, a, an illness, a terminal illness. Uh, he died shortly after Emmett's return, leaving him an inheritance of £2,000. And Emmett immediately used that money to help finance the rebellion. He began renting houses in Dublin under a variety of assumed names. And from about March 1803, after his 25th birthday, he decided to disappear completely. And from that point on, he only travelled around using a variety of fake names. He also fell in love. And he fell in love with the sister of his best friend in Trinity. He was Richard Curran, she was Sarah Curran. Their father was John Philpot Curran, the brilliant lawyer who had defended Theobald Wolftone and the other leaders in 1798. But Emmett kept the relationship a secret from everyone, from John Philpot, from Richard, from the entire family, because he knew that if the rebellion failed, then that would bring a whole lot of misery on anyone associated with him. And he didn't want Sarah Curran to suffer. So they communicated secretly. Uh, uh, she always gave him instructions to destroy her love letters. Uh, so that way she would not be implicated if the rebellion went wrong. And he began constructing weapons depots in, in Dublin. One on Thomas Street, uh, one on Patrick Street, where they began manufacturing the rockets. And all the time he began planning for a rebellion on the 23rd of July, 1803. The idea is that Irish people would rise up first, capture Dublin Castle, capture the Lord Lieutenant if possible, hold him hostage. The rebellion would spread to the rest of the country. There'd be a rising in Ulster under Thomas Russell. And then, once the country was in the hands of Irishmen, then you would invite the French to come because they would be coming as allies to support what had already been won, but they would not be coming to do all the fighting because then they might stay around and decide to rule Ireland themselves. So the 23rd of July was the date set for the rebellion. The problem is that the closer they came to the rebellion, everything that could have gone wrong did go wrong. On the night of the 16th of July, there was an explosion in the weapons uh, depot, the rockets depot on Patrick Street, and the police raided it to discover uh, uh, what had caused the explosion. But even then, the police didn't think that it was a weapons dump. They thought someone was making whiskey illegally, so their suspicions were not raised. And the great thing about the 1803 rebellion is that it succeeded where so few of the other rebellions in Irish history had, in that it caught the British completely by surprise. The chief minister in Ireland, the chief secretary who was there in charge of running the administration, was William Wickham. And he was the best British spy on their payroll. He had been kicked out of every country in Europe uh, in the past five years because of his spying activities. He'd been involved in various attempts to assassinate Napoleon and the other French leaders and so on. And no country wanted to touch him. The only reason he was in Ireland is was because no one else wanted him. Well, this key spy master was the man in charge of Ireland and he was caught completely by surprise. He wrote a letter the day of the rebellion saying Dublin is perfectly quiet. We have no worries, nothing will happen. So that was the great genius of the, of the rebellion. The failure, well, I suppose partly is that everything that could have gone wrong did go wrong. Uh, Michael Dwyer, the Wicklow rebel who had been on the run since 1798, had a different interpretation. He said that if Emmett had brains to his education, he'd have been a fine man, meaning that Emmett knew all the book learning. He knew about how to lead a rebellion in theory. He had this constructed this brilliant plan in theory. It all worked beautifully on paper. You would divide Dublin north side and south side, cut off the Liffey. You would block off streets and then ambush the British troops as they went down by blocking off the roads and then firing rockets at them. You would uh, attack Dublin Castle and his plan for attacking Dublin Castle was ingenious. They had rented a house right beside it and they were going to explode a mine in the wall so they could tunnel in underneath. At the same time, groups had grappling hooks and they were going to attach the grappling hooks to the wall and then climb in and abseil down and attack 
uh, from a side part. And then the third attack at Dublin Castle, they had rented a carriage which they had dressed up as if it was going to a ball in Dublin Castle and they would trick the guards into opening the gate and then they would jump out and capture the gate. Meanwhile, other rebels abseiling down the walls. Meanwhile, others tunnelling in through the wall. A brilliant, ingenious plan. Emmett, it seemed, had thought of everything, except he hadn't. And on the day of the rebellion, it all went horribly wrong. The man who was making the fuses for the rockets lost them. And so the fuses couldn't, no fuses, no rockets, the rockets could not be used. And one of the most ingenious parts of the rebellion, well, nothing happened. Secondly, Emmett had counted on absolute secrecy now, the great advantage of that is that the government was caught completely by surprise. They didn't expect a rebellion in 1803. They thought Dublin was perfectly quiet. So the government was caught completely by surprise. But so too were the rebels. When Emmett gave the signal to the men, come to Dublin, our rebellion is coming, it wasn't enough time to mobilise them all. And they all began streaming then into Dublin. But they were a bit confused because they hadn't heard any plan. And they asked to see their leader. They asked to see who was in charge of this, of this operation. And they were brought to see Emmett, this Trinity man, this 25-year-old. And they looked at him and they weren't impressed. They said, is this boy the person who's leading us into battle? What military experience does he have? Well, Emmett had none. He had never fired a gun in battle. They weren't impressed. And so many of them turned around and went home telling rebels they met along the way, don't go into the city. There's a boy in charge. It's not going to work. It's a complete disaster. Others who came in said, okay, well, we're prepared to give you the benefit of the doubt. What guns do you have? Because they had all the fold up pikes, but they only had one pistol and that was Emmett's. And Emmett said, well, look, we've ordered guns from a gunsmith. We have lots of pistols that we've ordered and rifles and we'll go and collect them now. And he sent one of his trusted lieutenants off with the money to collect the guns. And the man took the money and he never came back. And W.B. Yeats, when he was talking in New York about Robert Emmett, he had a brilliant line on this. He said, Emmett understood everything except human nature. And you see that clearly in the way he was bitterly betrayed by those closest to him on the day of the rebellion. So instead of a thousand men in Dublin on the night of the 23rd of July, Emmett got about 80. And worse, they were drunk. There were a lot of bars and pubs on, on Thomas Street, the main depot in Dublin. A lot of bars and the 80 men seemed to have gone into all of them. Because instead of getting an elite crew of 80 fighting men, Emmett got a drunken rabble. And he put on his green military uniform. He read out his proclamation, the proclamation that would inspire Patrick Pierce in 1916. A proclamation that called for the lenient treatment of prisoners. No prisoners were to be murdered. There was to be no atrocities such as happened in 1798 because they would use these prisoners and trade them for Irish prisoners held abroad and that way uh, bring them home. But his own men jeered him when Emmett read out these lines. They were drunk, they were spoiling for a fight and they were not impressed. And so the clever plan that Emmett had constructed of cutting off the Liffey, of marching to Dublin Castle, of capturing it from three different points of attack, all of that had to be abandoned. And instead he had to go to plan B, which was to march in a straight line to Dublin Castle. But the men were too drunk even to do that. And so when he got to Plunkett Street and looked around, he saw that only 20 men had followed him. And realising that the rebellion was not going to succeed, Emmett decided to cancel the whole thing. And he sent out the order for the rebellion to be aborted. And he decided then to leave. He would flee to the Wicklow Mountains. And first he stopped off at Rathfarnham, where he was keeping a house. And he was greeted there by Anne Devlin, a woman who was a key part of the rebellion. She was Michael Dwyer's niece. She had helped him as his messenger all throughout the planning. And when she saw Emmett arrive, she said, Ah, is the country going to be lost by you, you coward? And Emmett replied dejectedly, Do not blame me, Anne. It was not my fault. <laughs>